And good evening. I'm Sam Brock in for Tom Yamas. We start tonight with that harrowing news abroad. The Islamic State now claiming responsibility for a deadly attack at a concert hall outside of Moscow, Russia. Chilling video from inside the ven venue shows multiple gunmen dressed in camouflage shooting at concert goers. Another angle shows groups of people trying to flee as this is going on. That attack unfolding here at Crocus City Hall. It's about 15 miles northwest of Moscow. Now, officials say the venue, which was packed, can hold up to 10,000 people. Shortly after the gunfire erupted, flames were seen engulfing this massive building. That fire burning for hours as crews raced to the scene. Russian state media says at least 40 people are dead, more than 100 injured so far. Children are reportedly among the victims. This massacre, just two weeks after the U.S. Embassy in Moscow had posted a bulletin, writing in part, quote, the embassy is monitoring reports that extremists have imminent plans to target large gatherings in Moscow to include concerts. I want to get more now on this deadly massacre and bring in Robert English. He is the director of Central European Studies at the University of Southern California. Professor English, thank you so much for being here. First, what's your immediate reaction to these reports out of Moscow tonight? Well, it's horror and shock, um, also some dismay that warnings from the United States to Russia, from our intelligence, that something like this could be imminent were not taken seriously. And so with some justification, there will be Russians blaming their own government for not being more careful and not listening and taking more precautionary steps that could have saved some lives. I want to ask you about the politics of that. But first, Professor, you know, Russia obviously has a lot of enemies on the world stage. Matt mentioned that. And yet the Islamic State has now claimed responsibility. Can they prove it? And are you surprised if it's true that they were behind the attack? I am not surprised um, for a couple of reasons. Now, many might initially think, wait, Moscow has been pro-Palestinian, pro-Arab in the conflict in, 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 um, with Israel, right, in Gaza. But looking deeper, Russia has also been a staunch enemy of ISIS in Syria fighting there. And of course, Russia had a long occupation in Afghanistan, not to mention its own Central Asian and Caucasian regions. Basically, Russia has made many enemies. And it seems to be that this attack came from an ISIS splinter group known as ISIS-K or isis Khorastan, um, coming out of Afghanistan that is so radical that it even targets the Taliban, Turkey as well as the U.S. and Russia. We find ourselves facing a common enemy here. You mentioned earlier, Professor, that this, of course, seems to coincide with that warning, the bulletin coming from the U.S. Embassy in Moscow that was put out on March the 7th, saying that extremists have imminent plans, that was the wording, to target large gatherings in Moscow, including concerts, so a high level of specificity here. Putin, of course, criticizing that bulletin is basically trying to create instability. Do you think that intelligence was specific to what actually happened? Um, even what was public was specific enough. And I imagine that behind the scenes, they gave their Russian, they offered their Russian colleagues more detail on, on which group and what they might do. Um, and of course, the Russians will say that concert security was tight, that you can't prevent every attack. And to some extent, that's true. We certainly know of many terror attacks and, and massacres, even at uh, musical venues and concerts in our country, all over Europe. But there will still be many recriminations, and we'll probably see some Russians blaming the Ukrainians, blaming the Americans for somehow you know, causing it in the first place, sowing you know, discord and trying to divert responsibility from where it lies, which is in the Kremlin for not being better prepared. And I know you mentioned that splinter group of ISIS that potentially is behind this. I wanted to get your reaction as well, Professor. NBC News has just confirmed from multiple U.S. Uh, security sources that they were investigating ISIS. Your reaction? Yeah, it's no surprise. We, we, I looked into this two weeks ago when the first bulletins were announced. And, of course, I track as part of my own work um, these kinds of threats emanating from conflict in the Middle East, conflict where Russians and Americans, Turks, uh, you know, intersect in that part of the world. So the existence of ISIS-K and its extreme nature were no surprise. Remember, this is the group that killed uh, more than 100 in the um, final chaotic stages of the U.S. evacuation from Afghanistan. 13 American servicemen were killed by ISIS-K. Right now, 40 or more Russians have been killed by the same group. It does make for some odd bedfellows when we have a common enemy, even as we are adversaries ourselves. 
I really wanted to drill down on one last point that we've sort of touched upon briefly, but what is the perception among the Russian people, right? You have Vladimir Putin who basically pushed this all aside and said, no, there's nothing to see here with the security warning. Are there potentially going to be people absorbing this in such a way where Putin was putting politics over national security? Do you think that will really permeate in Russia? It certainly will in some circles, all right? And they'll be justified. You know, openly, the Kremlin denounced or at least dismissed American warnings as some kind of diversion, as some kind of political game. And um, they're shown to be flatly wrong. There's no getting away with that. Um, and so it will cause recriminations. The Kremlin, will, in turn, will simply try to sweep responsibility, specific responsibility aside, and use this for a kind of rally around the flag and to justify an even more militarized atmosphere. And it will work with many Russians who don't parse the details of what exactly happened. But intelligent Russians who follow the news closely cannot help but conclude that their government let them down badly. And this is not the first time terrorists have carried off attacks where Russian security was substandard. It's the first in nearly a decade of this magnitude. But they remember what happened before, and it won't help Putin's popularity. It will be another dent in his armor of infallibility and the father that protects you from our enemies abroad. It's hard to maintain that facade when these things happen in such a bloody fashion. Yeah, the reality versus just the spin there. Professor English, thank you so much. Really appreciate your insight tonight. Well, we well, turn now to the stunning news out of the UK. Tonight, Princess Kate revealing that she's being treated for cancer. That announcement made today by Kate herself in a video released by Kensington Palace. This coming after weeks of speculation over her health after the 42-year-old underwent major abdominal surgery back in January. NBC's Molly Hunter has more. It has been an incredibly tough couple of months for our entire family. Tonight, after months away from her royal duties out of the public eye, a deeply personal update from the Princess of Wales. In January, I underwent major abdominal surgery in London. And at the time, it was thought that my condition was non-cancerous. The surgery was successful. However, tests after the operation found cancer had been present. My medical team therefore advised that I should undergo a course of preventative chemotherapy, and I'm now in the early stages of that treatment. This, of course, came as a huge shock, and William and I have been doing everything we can to process and manage this privately for the sake of our young family. Kate's health has been the subject of speculation and wild conspiracy theories for weeks, only heightened by a Mother's Day photo which the 42-year-old later apologized for altering. And just days ago, UK media reports that the clinic where Kate underwent surgery back in January could be investigating three staffers for allegedly trying to access her medical records. It has taken me time to recover from major surgery in order to start my treatment. But most importantly, it has taken us time to explain everything to George, Charlotte and Louis in a way that's appropriate for them and to reassure them that I'm going to be OK. Kate also highlighting the support she's received from the Prince of Wales. Having William by my side is a great source of comfort and reassurance too, as is the love, support and kindness that has been shown by so many of you. It means so much to us both. 75-year-old King Charles is also being treated for an undisclosed cancer discovered during a January prostate procedure. Tonight, the king saying he is so proud of Catherine for her courage in speaking as she did. And from California, Harry and Meghan saying, we wish health and healing for Kate and the family and hope they're able to do so privately and in peace. No matter how you look at this news, it is clear that the royal family is in crisis. This not only is a crisis for a family, a family of human beings, a grandfather, a son, parents, but this is a crisis for the royal family as an institution. Tonight, messages of support coming in from around the world. And we'll be praying for them. We will be, we'll be praying for the family. They've been through the mill a little bit over the last few years. We wish her a full recovery. And Kate's brother saying, over the years, we have climbed many mountains together as a family, we will climb this one with you too. As she continues her treatment, Kate asking for privacy for her family. We hope that you'll understand that as a family, we now need some time, space and privacy while I complete my treatment. My work has always brought me a deep sense of joy and I look forward to being back when I'm able. 
but for now I must focus on making a full recovery. And at the end of her video message, the Princess of Wales taking the time to offer words of comfort and hope for those also affected by cancer. For everyone facing this disease, in whatever form, please do not lose faith or hope. You are not alone. And Molly Hunter joining us now from London, the support so evident, Molly, for Princess Kate there. And, and obviously, there's been so much speculation, right, by the public about Princess Kate's condition. And even though we don't know exactly what type of cancer she's dealing with, is there at least some hope now that this is going to end the rampant rumors? Yeah, Sam, I think more than some hope, I think absolutely in Kensington Palace, among the British public and certainly among the British press, there is a lot of hope that this will take the wind out of the sails of all the social media royal watchers from around the world who've been peddling these wild conspiracy theories, all of this speculation. And you heard it in her voice, this kind of real plea for privacy for her young children, for her family as she processes this, as she deals with this going forward. And we also know from Kensington Palace, from a Kensington Palace spokesperson, and they are pleading with the public, with the press, uh, with anyone who's been paying attention to this story to basically lay off of her, to really give her the time to respect this yeah. privacy. They reminded us that she would be living her normal life. We may see her and really kind of imploring us to not uh, take those paparazzi shots, to not tweet it out whenever we see her and really let this family kind of move forward. Yeah, injecting some humanity into the situation, right? Because for so many people, they can relate to dealing with a loved one who has cancer. And obviously, this was such an emotional revelation to begin with. She's in a tough position here between the recovery, which we've talked about, from her surgery, and now the treatment. Do we know more about how sort of the emotional and logistical tightrope that the royal family had to walk, how they were doing that behind the scenes the last couple months? We know very little, and actually Kensington Palace has led us in a little bit, of course, to the mindset uh, of the family, specifically of Prince William, who has been out and about a lot, Sam. We have seen both Prince William and Queen Camilla a lot in the last couple of months, really carrying the burden for the royal family as both of their spouses deal with cancer treatments. I think one other thing, Sam, that we learned from Kensington Palace, they are not revealing what type of cancer she has. The only real timeline that they've given us was that we know that surgery in January was successful. We know that she started her preventative chemotherapy in February. The other big question that we have, which is not answered and will not be answered, there's no expectation that Kensington Palace is kind of going to come out with more information or rolling updates, is when we might see her next. Originally, they said at Easter, that is no longer the expectation. And I think right now, clearly, her priority is recovery and her family. She may pop up for events in the next couple of months, but Kensington Palace has been very clear that that should not uh, mark kind of a return to her normal course of royal duties, Sam. Yeah, a lot of unknowns and certainly a lot of people pulling for her tonight. Molly Hunter from London, thank you so much. For more on this now, we are going to turn to Dr. Jessica Shepard. She is a board-certified gynecologist affiliated with Baylor University Medical Center and an expert on women's health. Doctor, thank you so much for joining us tonight. You know, we see in Kate's announce announcement there that she didn't specify the type of cancer she has, but she did say that she started chemotherapy. So what can you tell us about the form of treatment and what does that tell us or inform us about what she might be dealing with? You know, first and foremost, I think it is important that we make sure that we give them the privacy that they need, especially for a woman and a mother and wife really trying to recover. But with this type of diagnosis, and obviously I was not part of her care, but I have had patients who have been diagnosed with cancer and going through that recovery phase, I do think that we have had some insight to what type of surgery she had, which was abdominal, but we don't quite know what the primary organ was at which they diagnosed the cancer. And I'm sure sometime in the near future, we may see that. Do we have a sense at all, if you're going to take chemotherapy as a preventative measure, as they said, that it can maybe help her prognosis? Or does this give you confidence that the prognosis is better than it otherwise might be? Yeah, absolutely. When we think of ca cancer diagnoses, and again, not knowing what specific type, we do know that certain types of cancer, especially in early diagnosis, that chemotherapy does have uh, studies that have shown that can be preventative to future cancers and also for recurrence. So hearing that she's had abdominal surgery and not, again, knowing exactly where it is, that may be from an in infectious form, an inflammatory form, but also we know with this cancer diagnosis, with her saying in her her own press release 
that everything was normal at first and then having the cancer diagnosis later on pathology results, that this may have been anywhere in the abdomen or it may have been anywhere in the pelvis. So again, very unclear, but we do know from the type of surgery that she had mm -hmm. that this was again from the abdominal region and or the pelvic region. Right, but abdominal region, like you said, can still lead you to other parts of the body. It's, it's still not obvious necessarily what she's dealing with. And also, I would just ask you, doctor, she talks about the spirituality of this. You even said yourself, it's important to give the family privacy. How, how draining is it, right, to be in the public spotlight like this and have to deal with all the speculation while you're trying to recover from cancer? How important is it that Kate does kind of go away for a little while and have some time with her family and to herself? I think that's probably the best thing that they could do at this time. Now, obviously, you know, having dealt with patients who have abdominal surgery, but with a cancer diagnosis, especially, and then having preventative chemotherapy, again, you can see that that's going to take a long course of time for many different reasons, because she has to heal from the actual surgery, but now going into a chemotherapy mode, there's going to be a lot of fatigue. There's going to be possibly any nausea, vomiting, and her to be able to do that on her own time with the care of her medical team, but also as a mother taking care of her family. I think that she does require a lot more time, especially being a public figure and making sure that she is completely well before going out into the public eye and making sure that her recovery is a success. Right. And I think obviously knowing within the full context, doctor, that uh, you have you, the, the king as well who's suffering from cancer. Right, You have two situations within the same family. Everyone right now is a support system, but they're also equally dealing with just a torrent of questions and people wanting to know more about what's going on behind the scenes. Thank you so much for your time and for your insight tonight. We really appreciate it. Well, we turn out to severe storms that are striking across the country as winter weather refuses to just make room for spring. 26 million under winter alerts right now from the northern plains into the northeast with up to 12 inches of snow possible across New England, or I should say the rain. Meanwhile, a separate system is marching up the east coast, bringing heavy rain and damaging wind. So let's get right to NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens with more. Bill, again, a busy Ugh. man. It seems like that's the case every day. You got two <laughs> big systems here. Walk us through what we can expect this weekend. Yeah, the timing of this is the problem. You know, over the weekend, a lot of people just kind of relaxing, trying to get in the spring mode, and they're going to be slapped in the face by these storms. So the first one, you know, we've already got pouring rain through Tennessee, northern Georgia, through the Carolinas, the rain has developed. The snow has moved from Chicago through the Great Lakes, and tonight that's heading into northern New England. But let's first focus on the rain, because this is going to affect the most people, and it's going to be another soaking storm that we're going to have urban flooding, and we're also going to have small stream flooding outside of the big cities, 53 million people included from Boston all the way down 995 to Washington, D.C. And it's going to be a cold rain and just a nasty Saturday. And it does appear two to four inches of rain is likely throughout this region, especially Saturday afternoon from Philly to New York to Hartford, Saturday night in the Boston area. And that's if we're going to have those flooding problems, that's when they'll be occurring. And then north of about a line from Albany to Boston, this is a snowstorm. This could be the biggest snowstorm of the winter in northern New England. Almost all of the Adirondacks, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine Someone is going to get two feet of heavy wet snow out of this, and that'll mean power outages and tree limbs coming down, too. And then once we get done with that mess, we already focus this next storm. Sunday, the storm really intensifies. Snow breaks out through the northern plains, the Dakotas, into Minnesota. It's going to be near blizzard conditions by the time we get to Monday. And we still think one to two feet from Minneapolis to Fargo, all through central Minnesota, it'll travel will almost be impossible as we go throughout Sunday night into Monday. So, yeah, it's going to be a wild weekend and hopefully not too much damage done. Yeah, hopefully this March madness really is more on the basketball court, less in terms of what's going on around your house, but for many people it is both. Yeah. Thank you very much, Bill Carrots. Appreciate you. We turn now to the latest in Haiti, where police continue to battle against rampant gangs in the nation's capital. Many residents there fleeing the country amid the overwhelming violence, as some can't help but be caught up in the crossfire. 1.4 million Haitians right now are on the brink of famine as the conflict is showing absolutely no sign of slowing down. NBC's Ellison Barber is on the Dominican, Dominican Republic Haiti border with brand new details tonight. Once again, bullets whizzing through the streets of Port au Prince as the national police force struggles to release Haiti's capital city from the grip of gangs. Bodies left where they fell next to gas pumps and collapsed wooded platforms. In between the burst of gunfire, people desperately search for their next meal. Sky News' Stuart Ramsey is in Port-au-Prince. 
Well, I'm in Port-au-Prince, the capital of Haiti. The people here have no idea when gang violence is going to flare in. The whole of the city has been beset with it for days and days now. So much so that people are now building barricades to try and stop the gangs getting through. Many Haitians now face an unbearable choice. Venture outside and risk being shot or stay inside and go hungry. Roughly 1.4 million Haitians are on the verge of famine, according to the UN, and more than 4 million need food. Haitians who have temporarily been allowed to cross into the Dominican Republic are coming to this market to sell oftentimes what little belongings they have to get food, things like eggs, so they can then take it back to their families who are still waiting on the other side in Haiti. Samuel is 18. He tells us he lives in Haiti but comes here to work and take food back to his family. Many innocent people are dying, he says. We do not want violence. We want a free country. The UN says more than 33,000 Haitians have fled port au prince in the last three and a half weeks. And Sam, the violence and the humanitarian crisis there, it is only getting worse. Back now with Top Stories News Feed. And we begin with a tragic update in the search for a University of Missouri student who went missing in Nashville two weeks ago. Police say the 22-year-old Riley Strain's body was found in the Cumberland River this morning. He went missing on March 8th after being asked to leave a bar while on a trip with his fraternity brothers. Strain was seen walking on several nearby security cameras, falling at one point. Authorities said there was no evidence of foul play, but an autopsy is pending. A deadly school bus crash involving pre-K students outside of Austin, Texas. This information just coming in right now. Authorities say the bus, a concrete truck, and another car were involved in the crash. The school says that 44 students and 11 adults were on the bus at that time, returning from a field trip to the zoo. At least two people were killed. It's not clear at this point if they were children or adults, and multiple others were airlifted to a local hospital. And a terrifying kiteboarding accident in St. Petersburg, Florida. This video from a bystander shows a kiteboarder slamming into the side of the pier. You see it right there before falling into the water. Rescue crews treated the 38-year-old man at the scene. Authorities say that he was seriously hurt, but now is in stable condition. A storm system with high winds had been moving through St. Petersburg at the time of that accident. Well, we head overseas now to Hong Kong, where a controversial national security law is set to take effect this weekend. Now, it's known as Article 23. Critics say it gives authorities there sweeping power to quash any government opposition. The move comes after waves of political protests, of course, in recent years, challenging China's authority over the territory. Janice Mackey Freyer explains. It wasn't so long ago that Hong Kong streets looked like this. <laughs> These days, public dissent in the city is far lonelier and more daring. And critics say a new security law threatens to silence what's left of Hong Kong's pro-democracy voices at the behest of Beijing. Known as Article 23, the law covers acts of treason, sedition and subversion, as well as theft of state secrets and foreign interference, but doesn't fully define what constitutes a crime. It expands on a sweeping national security law imposed by China in 2020 after pro-democracy protests closed down parts of the city and at times escalated into violent clashes between police and protesters. This new legislation was fast-tracked by Hong Kong's government and passed on Tuesday. It takes effect Saturday. Critics say it's too broad and vaguely worded and effectively allows authorities to crack down on anyone for any reason. What does the passing of Article 23 mean for Hong Kong? This is the bill that basically creates crimes against everything. Kevin Yam is a former Hong Kong-based lawyer and democracy activist who lives in Australia now. He's also one of the people accused by Hong Kong authorities of violating the national security law. They put a bounty on his head. We are basically seeing the Hong Kong government trying to slam shut the really last vestiges of room for criticizing it. A former British colony off China's south coast, Hong Kong was supposed to maintain rights like freedom of speech and assembly as part of a deal when the territory was handed back to China in 1997. But those guarantees under one country, two systems gave way 
as activists and dissidents protested efforts by Beijing to bring Hong Kong more in line with the mainland. Now under Article 23, those found guilty of treason, insurrection and sabotage can be punished with life sentences, inciting hatred against the Chinese Communist Party up to 10 years in jail. It's sending a chill among foreign businesses and investors. We're alarmed by the sweeping and what we interpret as vaguely defined provisions um, laid out in their Article 23 legislation. China has hit back at criticism from Western governments and the UN, calling their concerns, quote, slandering and smears. Officials say the new law affects only those who jeopardize national security. Regina Ip is a lawmaker who supports Article 23. She actually tried to introduce measures back in 2003 when she was security minister, triggering huge protests. Of course, I'm very glad that uh, this piece of legislation finally gets done because I know there is a, a need for it, both legally, constitutionally and practically. Thousands of Hong Kongers have chosen to leave, fearing jail or punishment. Simon Cheng says he was detained and allegedly mistreated by Chinese authorities in 2019, an accusation that was denied in Chinese state media. Now living in exile, he feels it's too dangerous for him to go back. I think very sad. I feel frustrated and even I feel very angry at what actually the government officials are doing on our people. Beijing has tightened its grip on Hong Kong in recent years, throwing one country, two systems and all its pledges into question. In many ways, these new laws confirm that Hong Kong is being remade and being drawn ever closer to the mainland. And that's going to do it for us tonight. For Tom Yamas and Top Story, I'm Sam Brock. Thank you so much for watching. Stay right there. There's more news on the way. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.